Okay, uh, good morning, everybody. Um, as uh, has been said, uh, my name is Jim Sedanius, and I am a professor of psychology in African and African American studies at Harvard. And um, this talk was really, or the work I've been doing for the last 25 years or so, has been stimulated by my experience as a political activist in the civil rights and the black power movements. And despite all the progress that has been made in the United States in terms of improving race relationships and gender equality, I discovered that actually beneath the surface very little had changed. Um, despite all of the efforts which have been put in, uh, the civil rights movement, I concluded, was essentially a failure. And the work I've been doing since has really been an attempt to try to understand why that movement was a failure. I mean, it was a failure in terms of not being able to produce um, group-based equality, right? What happens to you in life in this country is still very much a part of, a function of, what group you belong to. So I developed this theory together with a colleague of mine called social dominance theory. And social dominance theory starts out with a basic observation that societies are organized as group-based social hierarchies with one dominant group at the top of the social system and a number of intermediate groups in the middle and subordinates at the, at the, end, at the bottom. And this is especially the case in um, societies that produce economic surplus, not so much in hunter-gatherer societies, which tend to be more egalitarian. I'm talking about surplus-producing societies. Two most basic assumptions uh, of the theory are that since human uh, social systems uh, are ubiquitous, uh, group-based hierarchy is ubiquitous, it's probably the case that human societies are predisposed to organize themselves in this way. And secondly, that the common forms of oppression that we're, we've been fighting for centuries, like racism, slavery, um, sexism, imperialism, etc., are really manifestations of a more general trend for societies to produce group-based social inequality. The primary goals of this theory are to try to identify the multi-leveled mechanisms which are responsible for the production, maintenance, and reproduction of group-based inequality and hierarchy. And these mechanisms are multifaceted. They go from individual differences. Let's see if I can get this to work. Yeah. Uh, social situations, institutional behaviors, social identities, and the interaction between these various levels of analysis. Um, social dominance theory argues that there are primarily three primary types of social hierarchies, one based on age, where there's a distinction made between adults and children, and there's a rite of passage from one stage to the other, a gendered system in which females generally are politically subordinate to males. And this is, seems to be a ubiquitous finding. It varies in its intensity from one society to another or one time period to another, but the basic structure seems to be very similar or the same. And what I call arbitrary set discrimination. This is discrimination of one group, dominant group, against the subordinate group, usually. And these groups can be defined in terms of race or class or clan or lineage or minimal groups. Any kind of group that people, this group distinction people are capable of making can then constitute this system. The thinking I have along these lines has very much been influenced by Robert Trivers and Bateman's um, reproductive theory, um, 
parental investment theory, which basically argues that while males and females have common interests in terms of the things they do to produce uh, reproductive success, because males and females live on live in under different constraints and they're facing different challenges, they're going to develop differential um, efforts. So that for females, since um, reproductive uh, efforts are very costly, um, she will put her efforts mainly into um, parental efforts, taking care of the offspring that she has, putting large amounts of investment in them. But males will maximize their reproductive success by increasing the number of mating opportunities. This is pretty well known and um, is not particularly controversial now. This means that there are going to be behavioral consequences of these two different kinds of constraint universes. Um, among females, there'll be an effort to uh, have high uh, investment in offspring, be relatively choosy in the mates um, they have children with, and select high status and high provisioning males. Whereas among males, there'll be a relatively low uh, parental investment, high striving for status and power, things that females are attracted to, and great male-on-male -male competition. So this is as far more or less as the Trivers-Bateman model went. We try to push it a little further and argue that these differential male-female competing reproductive strategies have social political consequences. One of them is to produce patriarchy or the male attempt to control the reproductive uh, prerogatives of females, like mate guarding being one example, and what I call the arbitrary set hierarchy, which is dominance hierarchies among males uh, in defensive and offensive male on male competitions, uh, eventually leading to warfare. So this reasoning, these set of assumptions, led to the development of a sub-theory, uh, what we call the sub-theory of gender prejudice. And the basic argument here is that arbitrary set discrimination and aggression must be understood as a gendered phenomena. That is to say, as the first argument, that in general, males will display higher levels of intergroup dominance, social predation, xenophobia, intergroup violence than will females, everything else being equal. Second argument uh, is that, in general, not only will males be uh, the predominant perpetrator of violence and social predation upon others, but males will also constitute the primary targets of social predation. And third and finally, we argue that males and females will engage in social predation and discrimination against other groups for slightly different reasons. While male outgroup aggression and discrimination will be approximately driven by some combination of aggression and social dominance among males. Among females, this outgroup discrimination will primarily be driven by fear, especially fear of sexual coercion at the hands of outgroup males. So this first hypothesis, this first assumption, uh, constitutes what we call the invariance hypothesis. Basically, that xenophobia, predation, social dominance will be greater among males than among females, everything else being equal. Well, where is the evidence for this? Well, one of the things we've done in our lab is develop a psychological instrument, an attitude survey, to measure people's preference for dominance relations between groups which is called social dominance orientation in the SDO scale. 
And it consists of items like uh, this. To get ahead in life, it's sometimes necessary to step on other groups, or inferior groups should stay in their place, superior groups should dominate inferior groups, and the obverse of these, uh, all groups should be given an equal chance in life. And there are 16 questions like this. And um, we put in a lot of psychometric work in increasing the reliability and validity of the scale. Now we've also done dozens and dozens of validation studies to see whether or not the answers to this scale <coughs> correlate with phenomena that they should correlate with, like preference for war or preference for wars of aggression rather than in wars of defense, etc. But instead of going through all of those separate <coughs> studies, I'll just give you the results <coughs> of a meta-analysis of these studies uh, done by uh, Lee and Prado and Johnston. And this meta-analysis was done in 2011 using 101 samples with 28,000 plus respondents across 16 countries. And what the data showed was that in every instance, males tended to have higher social dominance orientation than females, and there were no exceptions to this trend. And the effect size of these gender differences were quite substantial. So compared to differences between social classes or ethnic groups, the effect size was very substantial. Second hypothesis is what we call the outgroup male target hypothesis, which basically argues that if we define ASA as arbitrary set discrimination, that's, that is to say the discrimination a person feels by virtue of being a member of a certain arbitrary set group, then it's going to be the case, everything else being equal, at the average level of arbitrary set discrimination experienced by outgroup males will be greater than that experienced by outgroup females. And there are lots of examples of this that we could show. We're going to show one of them uh, dealing with the imprisonment rate for 100,000 of, of women and men broken down by arbitrary set between black, Latino, and white. And naturally, unsurprisingly, the imprisonment rate for men is astronomically higher than the imprisonment rate for, fe for females. And <coughs> we see that black, the ratio of black to white female imprisonment is about 2.83 so that black females are imprisoned at about three times the rate that uh, white females are, and that the same kind of relationship exists for Latinos and white imprisonment rates. But what's most interesting is that these rates of imprisonment, these differential rates of imprisonment, are much higher for outgroup males than for uh, outgroup females. So here we see that males are much more represented, much more strongly represented as prisoners in the penal justice system. And this makes a lot of sense if you regard the criminal justice system as an instrument as of state power and state terror against uh, subordinate groups. This data uh, goes beyond uh, findings in uh, the United States or with African Americans. Here's a study done uh, recently, 2011, looking at the job discrimination rates for Arab men and women, or people applying for jobs with Arabic names or Swedish names, done in Sweden. And what you find is that uh, Arabs, both female and male, tend to get lower callback rates, uh, less <coughs> opportunities to get these jobs than native Swedes do, which is not particularly surprising. 
However, the question that they further asked this research team was, is the different, does the discrimination in the labor market go down when uh, women and men, Arab men and women, have greater job preparedness? That is to say, what happens if Arab women have two years more of job-relevant labor market experience? What happens to the discrimination rate? And what we see is that for Arab women, the discrimination rate goes basically to zero if they are more qualified than their Swedish competitors. But for males, Arab males, the more highly qualified Arab males is even more discriminated against. Okay? Um, hypothesis three is this differential motives hypothesis, which says that the motives for male and female discrimination or aggression against outgroups is going to be slightly different. Motivated by aggression and dominance orientation among males, fear and avoidance among females. And one way to uh, look at this, explore this hypothesis, is by looking at experiments done within the prepared fear paradigm. And this basically starts with the assumption that there are two kinds of uh, animals um, that we are exposed to over evolutionary time. Those that we're prepared to be afraid of, like poisonous snakes and spiders, and those that we're not prepared to be afraid of, like ducks and butterflies. So what's been done in this experiment is associate one pair within each either prepared or unprepared category with a noxious stimulus. And the noxious stimulus used here was electric shock. So every time a person sees, let's say, this crit a picture of this critter, they get an electric shock and are exposed to unpleasant white noise. And the same thing happens here. And naturally, using this classical conditioning paradigm, all you need to do after a while is show the picture of the conditioned stimulus, and you'll get this negative response, this galvanic skin response. Well, there is an expectation that when you stop pairing the shock, this conditioned stimulus, with a picture of the um, target, eventually the reaction will go away. It will extinguish if it's no longer reinforced. And that will happen with unprepared stimuli, animals. So the difference between the reaction of this and this will go away. But what was discovered in this early experiment is that the conditioned stimulus uh, effect of the prepared stimulus never quite goes away. Once you've been prepared to be afraid of or extra afraid of a dangerous animal, it doesn't extinguish very readily. Well, Olsen and the collaborators decided to use this paradigm on humans. And if assuming that, let's say, you're a white subject, you have uh, two categories of other males, those that you are prepared to be unafraid of, right? And uh, you're prepared to be afraid of if you're white, that is to say, black males as opposed to white males. And what was found was that once you are um, conditioned to be extra afraid of a uh, black male in this category, that fear never quite, went, never quite goes away. That is to say, it does not extinguish. Here is the acquisition of the, the fear response for uh, outgroup males. And when it's no longer um, reinforced, uh, 
the stimulus reaction goes basically towards zero. There is one little problem with this, however. Notice that both of the st all of the stimuli here are male. And using this uh, outgroup male target hypothesis, <coughs> we would argue that this is only half the story. Because we would not expect to find this with males and females together. That is to say, you won't find this reaction of conditioned fear to outgroup females as you do to outgroup males. And that's basically what the data showed, that uh, that after um, the s s period when this is no longer being reinforced, the stimulus fear of in-group and out-group females goes to zero. And fear of in-group males goes to zero. That fear of out-group males does not go to zero. And this is the case whether it's um, blacks who are the subjects or whites who are the subjects. I'll skip over this and get to this slide here. This is data showing that fear of outgroups among females seems to be associated with conception risk. And one of my colleagues, a Navarrete and company, did a study looking at tracing the uh, menstrual cycles of uh, young women and each day measuring the uh, negative affect uh, towards uh, African Americans. And what they found was that the more likely the female was, the, the closer she was to ovulation, the higher the level of bias against the outgroup male. And there's just one little exception over here at the end. And this relationship was quite robust. And it was modified by um, high and low fear of sexual coercion. So that for women who were not particularly afraid of sexual coercion, there is a slight positive relationship. But for females who are very afraid of sexual coercion, the relationship is much stronger. Or you could say this is just a function of the targets being uh, African American. Will you get the same response when the targets are minimal groups? And so there were two studies done to uh, investigate this issue. Uh, here we have the, the racial stimulus difference. And here these guys belong to different arbitrary set groups. And will the same kind of fear reaction be evident um, in that situation. And here in this study, the DV was evaluative bias, intergroup bias, as measured by the IAT, or the um, Implicit Association Test, which I don't have time to explain, but it's a measure of implicit attitudes. And it works uh, in the case of racial groups, we've seen that before, and we get the same kind of relationship with uh, minimal groups, which is to say that as conception risk goes up and as and among those women who are very much afraid of uh, sexual coercion, the attitudes of towards outgroup males becomes particularly negative. So in general, I'm just about to finish up now. Arbitrary set, we argue, discrimination, including warfare and uh, aggression, is a gendered phenomena, which means that compared to females, males are more likely to exhibit uh, xenophobic behavior and social predation. Uh, and males are more likely to be targets of social predation. And the motives for social predation among males and females 
are slightly different. Aggression in one hand and fear of uh, a t- sexual molestation on the other. And at that point, I think I'll stop. Yeah, Jim, I, r- I really like that, and I, I don't have any quibbles with anything that you said. I just wanted to um, add what might be another dimension that I'm not sure you're taking into account yet. Um, Trevor's contributions in biology are really important. One of the new biological understandings of humans that I think uh, you probably haven't been exposed to much yet is that there's really strong evidence that humans have been cooperative breeders for probably more than a million years. Right. And what that means is that females, in particular, have a long ancestral history of raising their offspring with really significant help, often coerced help. Mm-hmm. And what I suspect um, that means, and we've had very little uh, talk about this, is that warfare is often um, oriented towards slavery as one of the most uh, right. obtaining a subservient class of laborers. And I think that it's really likely that females have as much of a taste for that as males because they have a long period of obligate uh, reproduction with coerced helpers. So uh, w- what I'm guessing is that um, in the societal level discussions that go on motivating you know desire to attack neighboring groups uh, for the purposes of uh, dominance that can be used as exploitative labor dominance Mm -hmm. everything from servitude to slavery that you're going to find that females are just as enthusiastic about those types of aggression as men. I mean that makes sense Kim the only problem with it is that it's not consistent with Mm -hmm. our empirical findings regarding what we call social dominance orientation, which is the taste w- for and the desire to establish hierarchical relationships between dominance and subordinates, even by the use of force. We don't see that, um, that evidence, right? That we see a very consistent gender difference regardless of the countries we go into, regardless of the controls we put on so that there doesn't seem to be any interaction between this gender difference and any other thing we can think of, with the exception of one case, and that is in Scandinavia, which has a high level of gender egalitarianism. The male-female differences in dominance orientation are higher and not weaker. 